Okay, uh, I think we'll get started even though people are still online uh, for uh, getting lunch uh, so that we'll have full time for the uh, presentation and discussion. I, I want to thank you for coming on this uh, day before the day before spring break uh, and uh, uh, welcome Professor Rakoff um, who was involved in the curricular revision that led to the development of the uh, legislation and regulation courts, and he will offer some reflections on uh, the incorporation of diversity and social justice issues in that course. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and I, I want to start by saying uh, some of what I'm going to say, I only th thought up in the last half hour. So, so I reserve the right to change my mind an hour from now. But I'm going to, I'm going to go. Um, so justice and, and regulation. So let's just, I mean, let's just talk about, for a second, just notice some of the things that, that are happening right now, right? Is it just to... Uh, pass an environmental regulation, which is going to save uh, many statistically calculated lives, but put a lot of coal miners out of work? Is it just uh, to require people who don't want to buy health insurance to pay a several hundred dollar tax to help other people buy health insurance? Is it just to require uh, people who advise on what where you should do with your retirement money to have to take uh, a fiduciary attitude towards the people they're advising rather than being able to partly consider their own interests. All these things are up in front of Congress and the agencies right now, and they all raise questions of justice. Who's going who's to gain? Who's going to lose? And what's the right judgment? So that's the question I ultimately want to get to. But I want to back up a little bit and just talk about the way the uh, regulatory state that we live in is organized because that sets the framework for what kind of solution we might think of to the problems I just posed. Um, so this diagram, which those of you who've taken reg, reg with me I hope recognize, uh, and the rest of you, I'll explain it, is, is meant to be a, a, uh, a simplistic but accurate description of our current legal system. At the core of our current legal system is constitutional law and the common law. That's historically the core, and it's conceptually the core of, of our legal system. Around it are Securities regulation, consumer law, labor law, banking law, communications law, I could keep going, are the various sectors in which regulation takes place. Now, the thing that I want you to notice is that regulation takes place in sectors, whereas the core of constitutional law and common law does not take place in sectors. So just to give you a sort of a, a practical example of that. If you were uh, writing a brief about fraud and you were talking about common law of fraud, you could legitimately cite a case about uh, a used car dealer turning back speedometers that it has to be intentionally done in order to constitute fraud, you could cite that as to what someone has to say in a prospectus for offering new securities, that it has to be intentionally done, it, it, the, the misstatement has to be intentional in order to constitute fraud. But out here in the sectors, you cannot do that. You cannot cite an interpretation of Rule 10b-5 passed pursuant to the Securities Acts by the Securities and Exchange Commission 
as authority for what should be done in, let's say, the Truth in Lending Act out here in consumer law. They're in totally different acts. They proceed on totally different bases. The interpretation of the words of the act are what you have to start with. And you don't have a general principle that you can carry over. These lines are hard lines preventing you from moving, whereas down here in constitutional law and common law, you can move around because things are stated at a very high level of, very high level of abstraction. Now, why does the regulatory system look that way? All right? Partly, it's a way of the way we pass statutes in this country. Statutes don't happen sort of slow, nice, gentle increments of thoughtful people sitting there in the Capitol building. You all know that. Statutes happen in great bursts when the political uh, push finally gets strong enough to have something happen. And then it's usually in reaction to some specific problem in some specific sector of the economy or the society. And then the statutes typically delegate to an agency, and the agencies only have partial authority, right? So this is the National Labor Relations Board. This is the Federal Reserve System. This is the Securities Exchange Commission. So the statutes happen in sectors. They delegate in sectors. And finally, we might say there's, there's some constitutional logic behind that as well. Uh, the statutes, except in foreign affairs and uh, military things, you, I, I guess I can't say 100 percent, 90 some percent say that the signature that you need to make the regulation effective is the signature of the secretary of such and so, not the president of the United States. And those of you who follow the confirmation hearings on Capitol Hill will know that that's actually pretty important because it means there's another person between the president and something happening. And what that additional person, how independent that person is going to be, is the subject of many weeks of, of dispute right, right now. So the power is split up. It's split up in separate agencies established at different times for different purposes. And that's an entirely different idea from the common law slowly accreting as the judges slowly decide decisions based on precedent and trying to fit into a world that fits, fits together. Now, my question is, what are we going to do about justice in all these sectors? Right. We, if the leg reg course, and for that matter, the administrative law course, pretty much teach, treats that as only a procedural question. The thing that is uniform from labor law to consumer law to securities regulation is the Administrative Procedure Act. It's the notice and comment process. It's due process hearings. It's procedural stuff. But the question I want to put is, is there, are there substantive principles of justice that would move around, that would allow us to treat this as less sectorized, if I could put it, put it, put it, put it that way. So historically, the big attempt at that was the regime of substantive due process. Not, not the new substantive due process of Roe v. Wade, but the old substantive due process of Wagner. Right? The, 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 the courts tried to unify their, the ju their view of the justice of all these various statutes in the beginning of the regulatory regimes um, through the doctrines of substantive due process. And that worked by saying, by conceptualizing the market as a regime of freedom, of liberty, and then saying, you could only go a little bit past what the common law allowed be, before you reach the cutting off point as to what the courts would say was constitutionally acceptable. All right? Now, that, by, re, by understanding the market as a regime of liberty, 
or the understanding the question of regulation as how much can liberty be infringed upon, um, <coughs> the courts inevitably, and they were quite open about this, accepted economic inequality. They just said, what we care about is the freedom of the thing, and we're not looking at how much inequality uh, is a result. Now, uh, if you wanted to defend that the Lochner regime, I don't imagine there are many people who, in this room who want to, but just to say what the defense would look like, you could, you could defend it as simply on a f liberty basis. You could say, we don't care about equality. All we care about, if each transaction is free, we'll accept the result of the 10th transaction or the 12th transaction or the 15th tr transaction, as long as they're each one is not under duress. And that's essentially the view, um, for those of you who might have read it, of uh, Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and U Utopia. Um, alternately, if you wanted to defend it as a substantive justice principle, if you wanted to say, yeah, it generates a lot of inequality, but yeah, that's OK, because that's just, then you make essentially a dessert argument. It's the same, in, in structure, the same argument as uh, she worked harder than he did, therefore she deserved the better grade. Except the structure here is she was a better capitalist than he was, and therefore she deserves more money, right? That essentially is the argument of uh, Herbert Spencer, that the, the economic world is a world of Darwinian competition and survival of the fittest. So those, the, what the substantive due process people were doing, the justices who use that view, I don't say it's indefensible. I will say historically the defenses didn't work very well. All right? Historically, the liberty defense was subject to the obvious uh, complaint that what we're talking about, the 10th, 12th, or 15th free transaction, when we know that every, most of history is full of force, mayhem, duress, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to call it. It just isn't the way it happened. And on the substantive side, people said, well, maybe the people who are good at the market deserve more, but they don't deserve that much more. And maybe the people who are bad at the market deserve less, but they don't deserve that much less. So I'm just using this as kind of an illustration of how you could have a theory that says this stuff all operates in the same universe, even though, as I said at the beginning, the way we talk about the law is it's separated. So what are the possibilities today? Right? The, the going possibility in terms of actual institutional embodiment today is cost-benefit analysis. Right? The, 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 uh, uh, or to give it a fancier name, utilitarianism. Right? The, the, uh, well, I assume a lot of you are familiar with Executive Order 12866. It's the thing that sets up the OIRA review process. And it says that all federal regulations have to meet, all major federal regulations have to meet a cost benefit test. The benefits have to outweigh the cost. Now there's a whole literature on how you figure that, but that's the basic idea. And um, the problem with that from the point of view of justice is that utilitarianism, or cost-benefit analysis, is a, is a comparison of totals. It's the total cost to everybody in the society, or maybe everybody in the world, compared to the benefits to everybody in the society, or maybe everybody in the world. And we don't care for cost-benefit analysis who gets what. We only care about how much they, they get when we add it all, we add it all together. So, that's the way things stood with the Reagan administration 
uh, empowerment of the o OIRA process. Now, Clinton, when he got into office, changed it so that the formal statement of the, of the matrix now is do a cost-benefit analysis and then compare all the benefits and all the costs, including distributive effects. So the, the, the formal statement of, now, of it now, and this has been continued through, through, through Bush and through Obama, and who knows what's going to happen now. But um, at least at the moment, it's still the, the governing rule. Now, there's a real problem with that intellectually in that it doesn't tell you how you're supposed to consider the distributive effects when you count up all the costs and all the benefits. Right? It, it, there's no intuitively obvious way in which you measure what is the, let's say, monetary value, because that's what you're ultimately trying to compare here, what's the monetary value of inequality or the monetary cost of inequality or monetary cost of this much inequality compared to that much inequality. It's, it, it may be literally an apples and oranges pr proposition that you can't, that you can't put together. Um, but I'm also worried about what I understand to be the way this is actually done. All right, so judging from what Professor Sunstein has written about it, uh, which I can't say I've read all of because nobody can read all of what Professor Sunstein's <laughs> able to write, uh, the, the, uh, the basic idea that OIRA has been using, at least when he was head of it, is that um, if there's a regulation which is not quite cost-benefit justified, so the costs are a little bit more than the benefits figured in the ordinary way, but the regulation would really benefit poor people, then there's a chance that they would say, well, we'll let this one pass. Right? That's my understanding of how they're bringing in distributive effects, not by actually working some big number, total number, but by sort of using it as a, a little bit of a thumb on the, thumb on the scale. Right. If that's the process, it's subject to what seems to me a very big defect, which is it only goes one way. In other words, it says, well, this, this regulation isn't quite cost-benefit justified. Here's a little bit of distributive effect. We'll put that on the scale and we'll, we'll justify it. What about all the regulations that go the other way? The regulations that are completely cost-benefit justified. And if I understand the OIRA process, the sentence I just stated is the end of it. They're completely just cost-benefit justified, period. The power plant rule will save this number of lives, those number of lives times the $7 million or $9 million or whatever we calculate the value of statistical IB greatly overwhelmed the cost to the power plant operator's case done. Right. If it's cost-benefit justified, in other words, nobody's asking, but maybe it's got bad distributive effects. <coughs> Just because it's cost-benefit justified, if we care about distribution, it might be something really bad happening, right? It, it might be that, um, oh, I don't know. It might be that all the people who own houses along the seashore are rich. And therefore, when the ocean rises, the predicted one foot that is going to rise because the glaciers melt because we didn't stop the power plants from spewing forth, all we're doing is saving rich people's summer homes. I don't say that it's true, I'm just imagining. But shouldn't, if we really care about distribution, 
shouldn't we be caring about the stuff which is cost-benefit justified as well as the stuff which isn't cost-benefit justified? Shouldn't we be asking the distributive question across the board rather than only for rare instances where it's some kind of special wild card in the situation? So I try to imagine what that would look like. Um, and uh, I'm totally unsure of the following, but here's just for something to think about, all right? Suppose we um, started with um, John Rawls' theory of justice. So uh, to, to turn a really sophisticated long book into one sentence, uh, suppose we started with the proposition that inequalities are justified only if they make the worst off people of the, in the society better off. In other words, inequalities are justified if they have a sufficient incentive effect or a sufficient uh, power that the whole society gets richer and the people at the bottom get richer than they would have been if the inequality hadn't been allowed. All right? that's, that's Rawls's test for a, a legitimate inequality. Um, now, as he's discussing it, it's meant as a criterion to be applied to the whole social system. No one ever votes on a regulation or statute which is the whole social system. So can we take that down to particular um, proposed rules or particular proposed statutes? And so I'm wondering whether we could invent a... Uh, an inequality impact statement, whether, whether it be possible to do uh, the work uh, accompanying each proposed major regulation, let's say, uh, to, uh, that it, there'd be a cost-benefit analysis, and, but then could there also be a statement as to what its impact would be in terms of rich and poor in the, in the society? So uh, I don't know the answer to that, all right? The, uh, there are some real problems in doing it. The, the predictive problems are very tough. And just to say a, a couple of places where you might have seen some of the analysis of the kind that I'm talking about that you'd have to do, there's a real dispute whether rent control does or doesn't advantage poor people in rent-controlled apartments over the long term. And there's a real dispute as to whether imposing a minimum wage does or doesn't help the poorest wage earners in the society over the long, over the long term. So I'm not, it's not something where you can just sort of say, well, it's a minimum wage that helps the poor. It's a much more complicated question than, than that. Uh, but, you know, cost-benefit analysis is considerably more complicated than just sort of how many dollars is it going to cost tomorrow. So I, I, I think it's a technical problem there. I think if we worked at it, we might reduce the technical uncertainties enough that we'd say we got some value out of having such an impact statement. I think the, there would be a real... Uh, Normative question, too, which is suppose we had an inequality impact statement, um, what would we be looking for? All right. would we, now, Rawl says what we should look for is what happens to the very poorest people in the society. Um, the political lingo that uh, at least was used by, as I understand it, both sides in the last election is, what's the impact on the average person in the society, AKA the middle class, and not the poorest person. So we might have a, a, a dispute as to wh where, where we're worried about the impacts, the impacts coming. But at least we would have something to talk about 
it seems to me, in comparison to the just sort of, well, the costs are this, the benefits are this, let's go. Um, so I put that forward to you as a, as, a, as a proposition, that if you wanted to do something to sort of say, what would make this a more general sense of social justice, that that might be a way of moving from the current fixation on just cost-benefit analysis to something, something bigger. Failing that, in the present situation, and I, I go back to this because it's, you're in law school, so we've got to pay attention to how things are argued in the law at the moment. In the present situation, what you have is a separate statute and a separate agency in each sector. All right. And what we are then forced to do in terms of justice is to argue what was the actual political compromise evidenced by this statute or this statute or this statute. And then we can have an argument whether we're talking about the words of the statute or the, the legislative history of the statute or whatever. But we're taking the, the justice concerns and we're just knocking them back to how do we understand this statute. We don't even have a canon of construction that says in, in, in cases of doubt, <coughs> choose the more equal interpretation. There is no such canon. We, we go back to what do we understand Congress to have done at the magic moment when this started. And um, if you like your legal system to make sense, to be coherent, you hope for better than that. That's what I have to say. I'm happy to take some questions. Brandon. Do you push students toward what you think are just solutions? So, I mean, you began with a number of current day controversies, and all these have you know, a legal apparatus surrounding them. So, you get to class, you're talking about various things. Do you self consciously push? people toward what you think would be a socially beneficial outcome, conclusion? Um, well, there, <laughs> should there, one? There, if, if you don't, well, the, I, the, should one do that? I was going to say, there, there are lots of uh, monitors of the truthfulness of what I'm about to say <laughs> in, in, in the audience. Uh, uh, I would say, a two-part answer. You should ask about what is the just solution, and you should be um, latitudinarian in what you will accept as answers to that question. So that you will accept the fact that there's more than one answer to that question, but that the question should be put. Is that is that responsive? Sort of, but I mean. So you ask the question, you accept that different people are going to have different thoughts, but my question, but do you yourself, I mean, you, you have a position, you, you have a, you know, you're ideologically situated, you have your own views as to how you think the good society should, you know, be set up. Do you feel that you should push people toward what you think would be a good thing? No. I think my responsibility as a professor is to not do that. Do you differ? So one, one notices the old Socratic trick of. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're surrounded by, you know, a, a group of students who have ideas that you think are, you know, show backwardness, you don't feel that you need to help them along, nudge them towards the good, nudge them towards enlightenment? What's wrong with that? Um, I mean, I would think that I'm obligated to do that for every student, in, that is to say, in the sense of 
that here's what people would say in objection to what you have to say. How are you going to meet it? What are you going to do to, to answer it? Um, uh, I guess I am a, in, in, in an old-fashioned liberal on, the, on this issue, uh, that students have the right to be where they are, uh, and I don't have the right to, to mess with that. Oh, yeah, that's, that was a tough question, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was particularly interested in what you were talking about. Uh, well, you just threw it out there, rent control. Um, and I think that is actually maybe a good thing, uh, particularly coming from Boston. But I'm wondering if we could maybe achieve more social justice if we reimagine the different economic classes. I don't really feel like we have much of a middle class. I feel like it's been pretty much gutted. Um, and so let's use rent control, for example. Um, so some of my students are here, so they might not know what rent control is. It's, it's limiting how much the landlord can <laughs> raise the rent. Um, so if we just said, okay, rent control, I think if we could you know, somehow bring it back or some kind of version of it, I don't think it would just benefit the group that we call poor. I think it would also benefit middle class <laughs> or uh, even what we might even perceive as upper middle class because the rents have gotten so crazy. Um, the wages, not even, I'm, I'm not even talking about just um, raising the minimum wage, but just, just people who have what we're traditionally good jobs, but they're just not making good money in light of the, the skyrocketing costs. So do you think we should reimagine <laughs> the different economic classes um, to maybe find better solutions or at least have more interesting discussions? Because it's not just the poor that need help. It's the people who we keep on saying are middle class, but they're not really middle class. But so they're not maybe poor. So that, that's a, um, a question of sort of um, political ideology as well as statistic, statistical fact. I mean, the, my understanding is roughly 80% of American society, if you ask them what are you, would answer on middle class, right? So that seems statistically wrong, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, you know, has a... Um, has both a mystifying aspect to it and a solidarity creating aspect to it, and I'm not quite sure how you how you how you how you measure those. Um, so uh, I do think if we started to do the kind of analysis that I'm talking about, it would have to be more sophisticated than simply poor, middle class, rich. I do I do agree with that. I wonder why equality is, is a separate standing alone factor that you're considering. Why isn't it just one other factor we need to put in into the cost consideration? Because I know it sounds, might be quantitatively difficult to do, um, but eventually the reason why we don't want equality, inequality, is because of the social tension it creates. So I just want to know why it shouldn't be part of the cost calculation and instead you want to make it a standalone factor? The, the cost-benefit analysis that's traditionally done has a very narrow view of what counts in life. Uh, it, what counts in life is what someone has figured out how to monetize. And uh, this is very hard to, uh, features of social solidarity are, at least my understanding of it, very hard to, to monetize. So I completely agree with you if you took, if you were doing cost-benefit analysis as sort of like what does, what do people really care about, that it would come out with a rather different set of what are costs and benefits from what is done when they get down to the technical, the technical work of, of doing it. So I, I just trying to move beyond the technical Aspect, aspect of it. Hi. So I just have, I want to pick up, uh, follow up on the first question. 
the problem to me seems to be that this is always an issue of competing values. So, and it picks up a little bit on this inequality question. So we have something called environmental impact assessments also, right? So you're supposed to count what the impact is, et cetera. So we put all of these different things in the mix. But the problem is, where do these values come from? Am I just, as a student, am I just supposed to come at it in my, from my life, from my family, what I believe? Where am I, if not, if I'm coming to class, am I sort of bringing these in already? Where are they being formed and forged? And if you're not guiding them and all you're doing is enabling me to think about different sort of values that all of us place on things, um, then what? How do we eventually, as a society, decide? How do things get sort of, you know, how does one regulation versus another privileging one set of interests versus another get made? Well, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, it was tough when he asked it, and <laughs> it, it got tougher when you asked. Uh, the... Um, I mean, clearly the school stands for some kinds of values at a process level, right? So clearly, for example, we actually believe in real facts rather than alternative facts, right? And uh, we also believe in hearing the other side of something before we go ahead and make our, our decision. So there, the question of whether a teacher knows enough to tell you this is what's good in life or this is how the society ought to be organized, uh, I don't think I know enough. I mean, if you're talking to me casually over lunch, I'd give you an opinion that I wouldn't give in class, but I don't think that... Um, uh, Teachers are, uh, that strikes me as propagandizing because I don't think I know it enough. Do you, do, you, do you have a different view? Do you think I ought to do more? I actually think so. I, I definitely think that there is, when you've weighed different things in the balance, as you're saying, there is a way to privilege. I mean, if the thing is the most, the poorest in society, the most unequal. I mean, if those are values that we hold dear, I think there is a way to push to bring those in. Just as I think the environmental movement, for example, had to do a lot to, to push the idea that we have to care about the planet that we're on. In well, I, I do think that what I did here today is pushing to take more seriously distributional effects of regulatory things. I think that's true. But um, if someone said to me, well, no, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in uh, the free market, uh, unregulated, because I, that's what I believe in. Or I would say, well, why do you believe in it? But I wouldn't say, go to some other classroom. That's right. But then could you point out to that same person that look at the effects of when you run it this way, completely unregulated, and then look, this is what's happening as a result of this, when you did this, or, you know, we'll pollute our rivers, or, you know, whatever we'll do. And, and then, then have them reconsider. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out if there's that sort of dialogical sort of process going on of where you are pushing the boundaries of you can't just believe what you're saying you believe. How do you justify what you believe? <laughs> For years, you and I have had arguments every year about <laughs> boilerplate in contracts, form yeah. contracts. How should the legal system deal with form contracts? That's true. Now, you don't tell, <laughs> you don't tell me, get out of the class, you know, leave the lunch table. We go back and forth year after year after year. You, you, you push, you push, I push back. But you have a view. Now, I mean, don't you have a view about, frankly, all of the important subjects that you talk about? And you, I mean, don't you push them? Now, how you push them, the question of 
how you might try to persuade people over to your view. I mean, it might be totally counterproductive to go too far. You might look, you know, you might look, people might, you know, t you know, just turn off their minds if they think that you're preaching in a, you know, condescending way or if you're, you know, you're a, a know-it-all or everything. But what's wrong with people simultaneously trying to illuminate a subject, but at the same time pushing a political project, whether the political project be anti-racism, whether the political project be anti-sexism, whether the political project be, uh, you know, um, anti-discrimination against gay people. You see the point. Well, I, when you say what's wrong, I'm not prepared to say it's wrong if, it, if some other teacher took a different approach to it than I did. So I'm not willing to say that, that, I, that I necessarily know I'm right. To me, it counts a lot that everybody does feel comfortable in the classroom, that everybody does. Uh, when I say go to another classroom, that, that's overstating it, but that everybody feels they have a place in the classroom and... Uh, in most contested things, that means that the teacher doesn't say, I know one side's right and the other side's wrong. Could I push you just one more time? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about a subject and somebody says, you know, with all due respect, um, I don't mean to offend anybody's, you know, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but it's clear to me that, you know, men are superior and should run things. What does one say? Well, it, you know, is that just another idea among many ideas? And, well, it's your view. Or is that an idea that should prompt some other response? That's a tough one. <laughs> All right. It's, it's tough because it is, to some extent, an attack on other people in the classroom. And, and therefore, to some extent, a teacher's job is to n stand against part of the class attacking another class, another part of the class in that, in that respect. But... Um, What I'm standing here thinking is, so do you just say, nah? Uh, or do you say, what would make you think that? Do you say, you know, do you give a little room for the explication or just stop? I'm not sure. And this is a question for both of the professors. <laughs> <laughs> Bifurcation might be too strong of a word, but sort of different roles of the professor as a scholar and as an individual who has a presence on campus and who may be developing sort of theories and, and practical applications versus the person who's in the classroom leading this sort of discussion and whether there ought to be in terms of this question of, of trying to manifest or push a certain value system. Well, to, to, to go to the point that Randy and I always argue about over lunch, uh, when, so I wrote a long article, uh, which had the good consequence of getting me tenure, uh, a, long, a long article about why boilerplate was junk. All right? He has a misguided opposite view. <laughs> so... so uh, but when I assign that in contracts, if I'm teaching contracts here, I always assign also Randy Barnett's article, which sort of goes right after my article in the way that Randy Kennedy would if he were in, there in person. So I do think that I ought to do that. I don't think I should just assign my view and not assign the opposite, the opposite view. 
I just kind of want to observe. It's just interesting to me that maybe this is part of the answer of why this is so challenging and why we don't regulate in this way with the general principle is because all in this room we've kind of devolved into process even as we're trying to talk about this and kind of now we're asking the question of how do we talk about values and what's the fair way to, to do this process. Um, and that's just interesting to me as someone who heard this idea about um, how we've taken the notions of justice in each of these regulatory agencies and reduced it to process. And then uh, we're kind of, we're just very vulnerable to that is kind of my observation. So. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that growing up for me, it was never an issue or a problem with values. Um, you know, which values are the better set. Uh, I think it's just a matter of creating a space where people, like you said, I strongly agree with your kind of philosophy of creating a space where just people feel comfortable expressing themselves. It's not the job of an educator to impose his or her beliefs on the students. And I think that it's important to kind of help people see, uh, if you're going to do anything, help people see that, okay, well, we can all agree that racism is bad, or you know, we should be able to agree that racism or discrimination of different kinds is bad, um, but that there are different ways to go about combating that. And I think that's the better place to kind of start from because I feel like things have become very polarized. And unfortunately, that's crept into you know, places of learning. And I think that that's one of the last places you should ever find such polarization, such uh, kind of standoffs between ideologies. It's a place of, you know, places of learning or places of critical thinking, independent thinking, and that's how it should remain. Um, since we seem to be having a discussion about pedagogy, um, I was wondering if Professors Kennedy and Professor Zirkoff wouldn't mind giving their perspectives on the role of the other students in the room when a student says something like uh, what Professor Kennedy said. Because um, you've talked about the role of the educator, but what, are, what do you conceive of the role as students and how does that impact your role as an educator? <laughs> First. So. Uh, the other students in the room are incredibly important in the educational process around here. I mean, I'm not a lecturer. I'm someone who thinks that what you really need is a discussion on pretty much everything we, that, we, that we talk about. Uh, the, uh, obviously, the other students in the room would be entitled to have quite strong opinions about, about that, even if I feel that I should be a little bit modulated. Uh, so I would certainly allow for that. I think that uh, the people who have very strong opinions and state them in ways that other people can hear them get further than people who have very strong opinions and state them in ways that other people can't hear them. Uh, so, so I think I'm, I might, I might um, quickly put down some ground rules for the discussion, but I think that it would be worth discussing. Two points. One, on the question of the teacher, I mean, everybody has beliefs, aims, and so long as they're upfront about it, I think that's perfectly fine. I think, you know, I think a, 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 a great university, yeah. So and so teaches such and such, he's an anarchist. So and so over there is a socialist. So and so is a free marketeer. No problem. And, and by the way, and they're going to bring that into the classroom. And they, you know, people might think that they're not, but they are. And my position would be, what's wrong with that? Um, and some of the people who were most effective at doing that are very careful to make sure that the people who, you know, see differently have space. 
I'm think, you know, and, 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 and their own ideas are challenged, because when their own ideas are challenged, oftentimes they're the most persuasive. As for other students, especially in law school, it seemed, in, in, for, for me, I never feel, uh, frankly, protective of the students. Students in law school are, I mean, it'd be one thing, I'd, I'd have a different view if I was in elementary school, I'd have a different view if I was in high school. If you're in law school, you're an adult, not only you're an adult, but you're within months of having people's lives and property in your hand. I think that every law student should have the wherewithal to speak up. I don't feel at all uh, it's, you know, protective. I push what points I want to push, but I'm very impatient if a student comes back, you know, after class and says, you know, I felt, you know, put upon. Uh, I think that every student should have the wherewithal to speak their minds and defend themselves. I don't think that it's incumbent upon me to be defensive of, of other students at all. And on that, I think it's uh, time we have to end. <laughs> <laughs>